Serpicon. Okay, guys, let's get started. Ooh. Okay, so we're going to be talk about Thinking Purple. Uh, just a bit of information about who I am. Um, I'm an open source guy. I have written open source tools in many languages. Uh, I have a couple of projects. Uh, yeah, there's some feedback there. Uh, okay. Can you guys hear me? Cool. Perfect. So I've written a bunch of tools, mainly in Python, Ruby, uh, PowerShell, Bash. I'm a kind of like a jack of all trades, master of none. So I typically like just picking new languages, writing tools, anything that will fit the bill for my needs. So many of my tools have been mainly geared at red teaming. Others have been geared at blue teaming lately. Uh, I've been quite active right now with several uh, blue teams and red teams consulting with them. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I've contributed to the Metasploit framework. I was one of the members of the board at P-Test. I'm part of Office of the Consortia at Puerto Rico. We do uh, try to help the community learn about security. We run B-Sites Puerto Rico over there. I'm a Microsoft MVP uh, for cloud and management. Um, and my day job, it's kind of boring. I'm a, uh, I'm a manager uh, in my day job. I'm a director of reverse engineering. I manage a, a group of people that are 10 times smarter than me, uh, which is awesome. They make me look good. Um, I'm also a podcaster, and on the side, I am a trainer and a consultant. Uh, so uh, I spend PTO for me's part-time office instead of paid time off. I typically just fly around doing uh, training classes on offensive and defensive techniques. So that's me. So the agenda for the presentation is going, we're, we're going to talk of what is red, my take on red, the take on red of many of the red teams that I have been working with lately, what is blue, and uh, what do we consider purple, or purple teaming, or thinking about purple. Uh, we're going to talk about the current situation right now in security between red and blue, and how, how do they talk with operations. And then we're going to go through the engagement types. One of the things that I noticed is that as I was talking with this big orgs on how do they do their red teaming and blue teaming and how they work together, all of them follow the same pattern after they have beaten their heads against the table after a couple of years building those teams. And all of them kind of set in that certain pattern. Typically, it tends to be three, three different types of, um, of engagements and then some general recommendations on how to make blue and red work better together. And I know that you guys are gonna hate this word, but metrics. How do we measure stuff to, to make sure that stuff works like it should be? So let's start first of what is red. Now, when we're looking at red, uh, I just went to a very good friend of mine, Justin Warner, sixed up. He works at Various Group. He's a very smart guy. Um, he used to work at the Air Force. He has ran, ran a bunch of red teams. He run, runs the red team at Ferris, the ATD group. Those guys are awesome. And um, so I went, I, I went to him. He's my subject matter expert on it. I'm like, hey, Justin, what is red? And what he said is an internal independent team that performs emulation of adversarial tactics, techniques, and procedures. The best uh, to test plans and systems, the, um, the way they may actually be defeated by an aggressor to challenge plans and improve decision-making process. So when we look at it, it typically boils down that typically if you have the budget, it, will be an, uh, it should be an internal team. Many organizations actually do not. I have talked with people all the way from Microsoft, General Electric, <coughs> Boeing, different companies and yeah, they have the budget, but also the majority of my clients out there do not. And when I'm talking with them, they, they were telling me like, but no, my red team is the guy or company that I hire to come in and do this type of work. And I went like, hmm. So we need a better way of hiring uh, red team in, our red teams, because typically what you get is you get your puppy mill pen test chop, that they go out, they grab a bunch of kids, they send them over to tech training, they come back, they're two monkeys, they only run tools. Uh, and, and you can quickly tell if you're getting one of those. Because they'll go in, they won't ask shit about your business, 
How does it operate? How do you make money? Uh, who are the key people in your environment? They'll just go in with a prepackaged SOW, prepackaged proposal. Here's the pen test for 40 hours. Oh, you want? Um, oh, you want for two weeks? Here's the price and the proposal for 80. Instead of going through that work, do you see that? Those are red flags. Kick them out to the curb. Um, and typically, they won't simulate actual TTPs of real attackers. Red is not let's hack and break shit. Even though they do, as part of their job, it is how do they do it? Their job is to emulate a real world attacker. Also, um, their job is to challenge current procedures. So one of the things that when we're looking with Red is that Red is the devil advocate of your organization. So if we look back at history of red teams, one of the first red teams that you're going to see there was back when the um, Catholic Church was having a problem of too many saints. They came out with the concept of the devil's advocate. And the devil advocate would be that person that would challenge uh, the people that went, no, we want to make this guy a saint. Why? Oh, he made this, he made that. And he would come in and challenge that notion. He would say, where's the evidence? What's your line of thought? What about if it is this other thing? What if he didn't do that and do it this way? What if that wasn't a miracle, it was just plain luck? What if that person actually took some type of herb and that is what cured him? He was the devil advocate. That is what a red team is actually supposed to be. They're the guys that have to think, not be institutionalized in your environment, and they're the guys that are going to help you uh, at that level of thinking in your environment. So typically, they'll conduct a series of operations. The first one's very simple, comparative engagement. Second one is threat emulation. Fourth one is, uh, uh, sorry, first one's comparative engagement. Second one, threat emulation. Third one, adversary emulation. They'll behave like an adversary. And then at the very end is a full scope assessment. They'll be doing no holds bar, Let's set out, let's plan what we're going to attack. Blue is, doesn't know what, what, what's coming. We're going to decide what we're going to do, set our ROEs, and then we're going to engage and see how they behave. And also, there are the guys that do the risk assessment of new technologies that come in. So many times when we think about red, we're thinking about the sexy, oh, let me hack. And we forget that there's a lot of other stuff that red should be doing or should do. Now, when it came to blue, what I did is I asked uh, my good friend Dave Hall, hey Dave, what is Blue? Dave was one of the guys in the Office 365 uh, Blue team. He worked at Verizon as part of their Blue team. He's one of the, uh, he was a SANS instructor. He ran the SANS blog on DFIR for, uh, for many years. So he's quite experienced with when it comes to being a Blue teamer. And what he actually told me is Blue team is the team responsible for monitoring and defending an organization's uh, information and assets. Uh, and this actually includes investigation, investigating and remediating security incidents. Um, so typically what they're doing is that they're hunting in the network. They're looking for that presence of that attacker. They're hunting, they're hunters. That's their nature, they're trackers. And I don't know about you, but I do find that sexy, at least in blue. I know that a lot of people say blue is not sexy. Well, my experience has been when I have dealt with blue teams that are properly said, properly trained, and they have support from management, it can be very damn sexy. Um, one of the things that they typically tend to do is that they develop those procedures that the organization should follow in the case of a breach. And they try to be as flexible as possible. They break out those, uh, those procedures into small chunks to, so they're not uh, tied down by a playbook that they have to follow a prescriptive playbook. They set up those procedures. Okay, we have this environment, IOCs, this is the type of guy we, we're looking for. Let's look at a knowledge base. Okay, this is the IOC, this is how we gather information. And they keep uh, some very cool data that many red teamers would kill to have access to on terms of TTPs of actors. Um, and one of the things that almost everybody fails on is they work with the red team to validate new risks in, inside of the environment. Um, and many times, uh, what we're also seeing is that 
uh, a lot of failure when they are working with Red to bring all of those tools, all of those techniques, and teach them out, teach those risks. But, but what we're currently seeing, as I'll talk later in the current situation, is that they don't talk that much. So, um, and, and one of the biggest missing parts is that Blue is the guys that work with operations. They're the guys that interface with the operations team to get stuff done. So they're the ones that help them develop those plans for instant response, how do we recover from attack. Um, and they're also the guys that work with operations to keep that stuff updated. I know it sounds boring. I know the hunting part is the cool part. But then again, all red teamers, you have to write reports. That's not fun. Many times you have to do tabletops, and you don't like tabletops. We tend to not be very social. So um, how about purple? Now we're going purple. Ooh, we're, we want to be cool. So purple's actually that symbiotic relationship between red and blue. How can we work together? How can we be good brothers to each other and work to make sure that the organization is secure? Because many times what we're seeing is we're seeing petty fights between them, and they forget that both of their jobs is to help an actual organization operate. Um, also, purple is when uh, both of them are working to, I would say, improve how the organization reacts to an actual attack. Um, so, tip so typically when we're talking about purple, purple is when um, red operates openly, so blue can make uh, sure that no risk is missed. So red is operating, we're finding stuff, we come into blue, we're doing our debrief, blue goes first, they're showing up, oh, this is all the stuff that we found. Red snickering like, you missed this, you missed that. Uh, but at the end, red has to open their kimono, like it or not, and say, this is how we did all of our stuff. This is our tools. You didn't pick all of those this IOCs. Then comes in blue, they improve their techniques. Red comes in, they get in again. Blue shows, and we want that gap between mean time of detection and mean time of resolve to kind of be shorter. Um, so, uh, uh, so purple is really us working together. So this is how it would actually look. Like blue and, and red feed each other. We learn from each other. Each one improves. And then that time symbiotic relationship between them feeds operations and all of the different teams in operations. And they work together supporting each other, providing enough evidence or enough backing so operations will listen to them to implement that. Because let's be frank, how many here have uh, read the book, uh, The Phoenix Project? Okay. You know how operations see security in the real world. That's a DevOps book. And you can see from the, I remember reading that book and at the first chapter just being pissed at how they were referring to the security guy. By the second, third, I was going like, yeah, we deserve it. Yeah, we're that cocky. Yeah, we're assholes many times. Yeah, makes sense. And then by the end, you can see that symbiotic relationship of security and operations working together and making the organization secure. And I'm like, oh, that's make, that makes sense. Yeah, that is how it should be. But in real life, what is the current situation that we see right now? This is our current situation. <laughs> and we see it from both sides. Blue gets pissed. Blue gets mad. Like, shit, dude, we work for the same freaking team. What are you doing against me? And then Red comes to the other side. Dude, you threw us under the bus. You asshole. Why did you do that? You threw us under the freaking bus. And you can see those petty fights between both of them. And especially, where do you see, uh, a, a, a bit of a story, where do I see this a lot is when they're doing their debrief and you have stakeholders in the meeting. It is all of them see who can brown nose the stakeholder the most. And I find that so appalling. When I see them like, oh, no, no, but you guys did this and you should do it. Oh, we should have ROE. You guys should have ROEs and you shouldn't do that shit. And the other guys, oh, yeah, and you should have detected this. Uh, detect this. 
Even a, fir uh, a first year sysadmin would have seen that event log and raised an alarm, and they'll go at each other's throat during the meeting, and the stakeholder, who many times is not a technical guy, is just seeing a dysfunctional security team. They're not seeing red, they're not seeing blue. What they're actually seeing is a very dysfunctional team that does not know how to work together. And that doesn't look good in business. And then when red comes in and I want training budget, we don't, they don't get it. When blue needs a tool or training, they don't get it. Because what does the stakeholder see? They see a dysfunctional team. And that's why many times neither team gets buy-in from the stakeholders. Because we, we deserve it. We, we don't act like a functional team many times. So um, other times it's just that management doesn't get risk. And that's where it's our job to social engineer manager in, uh, management into understanding the risk. We talk here in the conferences so much about social engineering, and yet we don't apply it to our job uh, with, uh, with the people that matter. So another thing that we see is that red team is forced to be institutionalized. What we're doing is that we're grabbing the red team. The red team's not thinking like the company wants them to think. They're not operating like the company wants them to operate. And we force them to do it. They're supposed to be your devil's advocate. They're the, they're the guys that should be there questioning everything that you're doing. Oh, I want to put in this password manager, and I won't throw them under the table. But I've, this is a recent case about two weeks ago. Oh, we want, uh, IT comes, we want to buy this um, password manager, and we want to implement it in the network. Uh, Red should go in and look at that password manager and look at everything that that product's doing. And probably they'll be able to tell ops, um, dude, I think it's bad that that password manager has to run with a domain admin account in a SQL database. Uh, and also its service has to be uh, domain admin. Oh, by the way, we start testing it and we did a man in the middle just to look at the traffic. It's doing this password resets in clear text. Um, oh, but it's in the Gartner quadrant. I, I, dude, password, clear text, domain admin. Are you sure you want to play that card? So Fred comes in, simulates several attacks, even records videos, sent that to IT operations. Now you just gave them what they needed to secure that. But many times, Red doesn't do that. Red goes like, I like breaking shit. I like pen testing. Oh, you have to help us evaluate this. Oh. Reminds me of my nine-year-old. Um, <laughs> honey, you have to do this. Oh, I have to do this. Uh, and many times we see red, and red not doing it makes you look bad. So also, um, one of the things that we're, uh, we're seeing is that we're seeing red as a checkbox. As a pen test, it's only a checkbox, and we're not able to change their minds. In fact, when we're uh, companies trying to hire us as pen testers, we don't even fight it that we know that they're looking at us as a checkbox. And in fact, you'll actually see Twitter handles out there that when you look at the description, checkbox master or checkbox whatever, many have come to actually accept that we're being seen as a checkbox and that we're no, no more. I see that as giving up. That kind of pisses me off when I see people do that. We're not a checkbox. We should not think like that. Um, also, another thing that we see is, uh, and this is because of the puppy mills, we are seeing a lot of people out there that, um, a lot of pen testers, that they have their toolkit. And I covered this in class. You take away their toolkit, they cry like babies. You cannot use Metasploit. Oh, man, come on. Come on, you're saying I cannot use Metasploit. Oh, don't piss me off. I'm going to take MAP away from you. You're not going to get it for a week. <laughs> And they don't know how to freaking operate without their tools. But when we read reports about APT24 from China, APT28 from Eastern Europe, and we report from many other organizations, they're not using Metasploit. 
They're not using a map. So if you're red and you're supposed to emulate their tools, their IOCs, their techniques, what are you using this known tool and you're not developing your own? What is the problem there? They don't have the skill set to, to do it. They've grown complacent. We're freaking hackers. We're super, on uh, both sides. We should like breaking stuff. We should like learning. We should like building. But now we have money and it becomes a business and we're kind of forgetting those roots and that's what DerbyCon and most conferences are. We have to go back to those freaking roots where we can adapt, we can overcome. I'm so, I'm so proud of the, um, uh, I've have, had the chance of train uh, Marine Corps uh, cyber protection teams. Uh, and, and those devil dogs, I have to tell you, um, they're going to an organization where there's no MOS for cyber and they're building their teams up and you can see the passion in them that they want to learn, they're building their tools, they're not relying on specific devices, they're not seeing boxes and saying, oh, with this tool I'm going to cover everything. And not that I'm ripping on the Air Force for thinking like that many times or the Navy, uh, they tend to be very good also. Uh, but I love the Marine Corps because they, they've always been that underdog that never gets enough budget, that never gets enough stuff. And they have kind of like this mentality of thinking outside the box, bending the rules, breaking the rules without getting caught or going to jail. And that's their mentality. How far can I take it before somebody comes in and slaps me? And, um, and that's what we should have with Red. Red, forget about your tool bag. Uh, try to improve on it. Blue Team's the other side. Blue Team is... Um, so tool bound. My sim doesn't see it, it's not happening. Dude, we got in. It's not in the sim. No, nope, you didn't get in. I was actually seeing that in a freaking meeting. I was going like, no fucking way. <laughs> Red team's showing the video. And the blue blue guy just keeps going like, no, it's not in my sim. And go like, dude, look at the screen, look at the video. He's in. And he's going, nope. No, it's not in my sim. Nope. Suricata didn't caught it. Uh-uh. Nope. And they're like, oh, shit. And then I'm going like, um, dude, they did volume shadow uh, to instill the database out of the freaking domain server. Oh, Microsoft doesn't give me a log. Nope, I'm, I'm screwed. And we're like, you know, you can actually write a bit of script, double my permanent event, change for win32 underscore volume shadow copy, and create your own event? Oh, man, no, 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 no. That's too much work. We have to get that approved. We got to document it and go like, oh, God. And you see teams like that. Be they, some become tool bound at both sides. They like their toys. They hate learning how to code or building their own freaking stuff. They lost that flexibility. They've been institutionalized. We kind of got to break that. So typically, the way we operate is that we have some basic engagements. Many of you probably are going to go like, oh, man, I already know how to do that. But believe it or not, there's a lot of people that don't. At least uh, when I initially I started, I was talking with my friends, and they're going like, yeah, we do that. Yeah, we operate that way. Cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're just repeating the same shit. And then when I went to other people outside, they're going, oh, dude, I never knew that we had to do that way. Um, so uh, for, uh, make, make, make sure that you look at several perspectives. I'm happy that my friends tend to be very honest and they'll, and they'll call bullshit on me. And many times they'll bring me down like, hey, Carlos, nobody thinks, uh, you're a PowerShell guy, nobody knows, uh, a lot of people out there do not know PowerShell. Do you know Python? A lot of people actually do not know Python and they kind of, okay, okay, makes sense. Many times I'm kind of jaded because of the friendships I, I take. I have a lot of friends that are great, they're good, and they don't know about this stuff. So typically, when we look at engagement, the first one you got to see out there is what I call a comparative engagement. Now, when we're looking at a comparative, uh, okay, uh, I'm having problems with the word comparative. Uh, my, English, my Spanish to English translation engine is failing me now. So I'll go with, uh, with tabletop. We're going to do our ta tabletop engagement. Typically, a tabletop case, we just sit in a freaking room and go, this is our risk. This is what we're going to evaluate. And you sit down and you hash it out. Red comes in. They say, this is how we are going to operate. This is all of the stuff that we're going to be doing. And Blue says, OK, so what IOCs are you detecting, uh, are generating? We would detect this. And you're working everything out non in a non-confrontational way. 
with, without having black humor, without um, calling each other names. We just try to work, to, work, work it together. Uh, what advantage does this do is specifically for many organizations out there. Uh, for the big ones, this is their bread and butter. They tend to do this constantly for the big ones. For the small ones, where, this is where I see the gap. They'll hire a company and they'll say, I need a pen test. Oh, pen test comes, okay, how are we going to work this? Oh, I want you to pen test my network, uh, but what do you want? I don't know. Hmm. The company should actually ask this customer, have you done a vulnerability assessment? And many times you'll hear, no, but I want a pen test. Okay, have you guys actually looked at your environment and ran some hardening? I don't know what that is. I want a pen test. And you should actually kind of guide them like, hey, let's, uh, instead of fighting them and, and trying to explain to them that a pen test is not what you need, you should actually go, okay, let's do this. Let's do a special type of pen test, a cooperative pen test. Let's bring your IT people in. We'll go in, we'll do our attack against your infrastructure. Your guys will be there in the room and they'll see how we're doing everything. And they should be telling us, hey, you guys were able to get in. Oh, we should block that. Oh, we were, oh, we took care of that. That is kind of like the cooperative engagement. That's what typically we should be kind of doing. Um, when blue and red constantly are working together, looking at the IOCs, looking at the threats of this new technology that you're bringing in, how are you operating, improving those plans, updating your playbooks, updating your internal knowledge base, um, and working on those insert response plans, and you're kind of validating those initially. That's the initial stage. We're just baby steps going in. That's the normal engagement that typically we should be running. Um, in fact, I was talking with a very good friend of mine and he was telling me, no, we're starting at this big company, Red and Blue, and he actually told me, we're having three full red engagement against us currently. I'm going, like, what? Yeah, we're running three against Blue. Blue burned out. And did you guys sat down initially and talk and plan it out? And did you guys initially did a bit of tabletop, you know, white uh, whiteboard, all this stuff? Nope. Red just simply went in and pummeled us. You're like, um, the, you, you, <laughs> that doesn't work. That, that is bad return on investment. Very, very, very bad return on investment. So when we're doing that tabletop type of engagement, typically what we, um, when do we want it? Typically when we're starting out. When we're starting to build out our blue and red team and we want them to think purple, we want them to work together, that's the perfect place to start with those. Many of, 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 of the other um, times that we want to do this is when we're bringing in new technology. In other words, we're bringing in new risk into our environment. We're bringing in change. We're updating stuff. That's when we want to kind of be doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's kind of like the best returning on value because you're discussing that, you're getting stuff fixed, you're getting stuff planned on the fly there every day, every hour, instead of just waiting a couple of weeks, then sitting down, then bitching at, at, at each other, coming out with the reports, and then taking those reports, taking them over to operations, and then trying to convince operations to fix it. Do you get a fix at the moment? So it's a, a lot better for, uh, from the get-go, but it doesn't simulate everything, it doesn't cover uh, everything that we should be doing. Also, we, we need to have clear cha channels of communication between each other, respect each other, know how to talk with each other. That's a, a soft skill that I've seen that is kind of lost. Um, now, I know that the second type of engagement that typically I recommend is what I call threat emulation. Threat em emulation is where we're actually se selecting a specific threat that we're worried about. Yahoo got pop. How did Yahoo got pop? Oh, it was uh, SQL injection. Uh, and they were able to dump all this stuff. Okay, let's look at SQL injection. What are the threats for SQL injection? Let's sit down between red and blue. What are the common tools that people use? These are the common tools. What are the common types of SQL injection that they're using? Can we block those? Yes, we're blocking those. Are we able to uh, engage in them? Yes. Uh, what would be the IOCs? Oh, I have this, and then Red can go like, yeah, but you're missing this one, you're missing this other. Oh, there's a brand new technique that just came out. Um, 
Same thing if you're uh, saying you're, you're creating a threat model where you have a bunch of machines that are exposed to probably visitors or other users, and you want to, let's say, use App Locker with Device Guard, implement that, secure them out, and all of a sudden, Sub T comes in and he does a tweet of a, a, a one more bypass uh, that week. Um, initially, you'll go in, you'll go, this is your threat model, this is how he did it, this is how he's publishing. Okay, let's simulate this, let's bring both teams in. Red, can you write tooling for this? How would you write tooling? How would you deploy this in mass? Um, what would be other tricks in your bag that you can join one and the other together, duct tape it in to deploy this and uh, abuse it? And then blue team goes in and looks at the IOCs, look at it was, implements some controls. Red team then goes, okay, you implemented controls, can I test those controls now? They go in with their new tooling, their new stuff. They test it, oh, you missed this. And you improve that. You're doing that threat model. Uh, and yes, I'm not following my slides uh, deck by deck. I typically hate slides. Uh, so I just like uh, storytelling more. So that's how can you actually do that. So you build your threat model. You define your engagement, uh, your, your objective. This is what I want to achieve at the end. You storyboard the heck out of it. All of the possibilities with red and blue there discussing it. You determine what, what is that you're actually supposed to be looking after you storyboard it. And then you have to execute it. You actually have to do it. You have to take it from paper and actually do it in real life. Um, many of you guys know that I like guns. I like tactics. I like martial arts. So let's bring it over to that side of, of, of martial arts. Have you ever gone into a JoJo or let's say a Kraft Maga studio or any of those and here comes the new guy, he's cocky, he's saying, oh no, uh, I'm the best guy, I'm the best puncher out there, I used to do boxing. And you ask about his experience and most of the time he's just hitting a heavy bag. Or he's practicing techniques with somebody else. Or he's doing Filipino martial arts and just doing flows with a, with a buddy. And you ask him, have you ever sparred, full out sparred? No, 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 that's dangerous, we don't do that. Um, you need that. You need that pressure to put all of those concepts into, into practice. Just, that's why you execute it. Because under pressure, under execution, is where you're going to see the flaws or the areas that you need to improve upon. So that we execute that. And then we debrief. And we debrief on it nicely. We talk to each other nicely. And then we update our playbooks. And this is the part that many, many teams actually fail. I've actually gone to many blue teams and red teams and I tell them, do you guys keep a knowledge base? Or, and, and you keep playbooks? No. Why not? No, 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 no. Uh, no. Um, we have our own uh, Will Harmjoy here that does everything. He's our top guy. We'll deploy him when we need something done. And then blue comes and says, no, I have my own Sean Metcalf. He's the expert and active director and knows how to secure stuff. We don't need to document that stuff. We have him. But what happens when they're not there? What happens when they're sick? And many times what you're going to find out is that this is a good way to gauge the level of ego and BS in your environment among your employees. Why? If they don't like sharing information and they see that as their own individual value, that's somebody you don't want in your team. He's not a team player. He's not thinking about the team. He's only thinking, how can I chime in the team? by hoarding all of this knowledge. So do make sure that you're keeping a very good knowledge base of every technique and everybody's aware of those. You're keeping playbooks, you're updating those playbooks based on all of those tabletop exercises because they'll become of value to you. So um, stuff that we have to keep in mind when we're working on this, uh, the main considerations typically tend to be um, that we have to uh, be aware of the time constraints. Many, m many times people do all of these tabletop engagements and they're going and they're storyboarding the heck out of it and they come up with a hundred stories. And many of those do not have to do with the threat model or the goal that you initially have. You set up that goal and then you start storyboarding and this is what only we're going to cover and when you sit down in that room and you're discussing those, They'll just go into one rabbit hole after another rabbit hole after another rabbit hole. And you want a perfect example of, uh, of an analog of that. Have you guys listened to when I'm in the security uh, weekly podcast and we're discussing a security subject and some, some 
somehow it's going from security to IoT um, to porn, and then from porn it's going to BSDM, and from BSDM somehow it ended up in Trump, and you're going like, what the heck happened here? Same thing when we're doing this kind of engagement. We have to be careful with that. We have to enforce uh, those time constraints, resource constraints, operation constraints, and political constraints of the organization. Because many times, a lot of this threat, many times threat can go like, oh, this is so sexy. Yeah, but that's only happening in banking. We're not banking, we're auto parts. Uh, distributor, no, no, but it's so sexy. No, no, you don't get it. We're not exposed to that threat. We shouldn't be doing this today. Yes, we should do it at some point, but not today. So you have to have all of those political constraints also uh, taken into consideration. The other one is adversary emulation. And this is kind of like a pet peeve of mine that I have. When we're doing adversary emulation, we typically go identify and select an adversary. This is the adversary that we're going to emulate. It has to be a specific one out there that you know that it could be a real threat to you. Could be a nation state, could be a malware group, could be APT28, APT24. You have to select a specific one. And then you go into threat, intelli uh, into threat intelligence feeds, and you don't use them for fucking whitelisting and blacklisting like almost everybody does. They're there for a purpose. They're there to tell you how does this specific actor behaves. What are their IOCs? What are their tools? What is their behavior? What is their order of attack? In what order are they performing that? All of that stuff tends to be inside of those threat intel feeds that a lot of people ignore. They just go for the MD5 hashes, SHA-1 hashes, and the Jira rules, and that's what we package and we deploy to our machines. And forget that behavior is something that we can trigger on. Behavior is that's going to give us that kill chain to block and break for that attacker so he's not able to move or traverse in your environment. It will give you that list of where you can add pain for him to not do stuff and you're able to detect it. So we select those tool TTPs, then the red team executes and behaves like them. That doesn't mean that if you're simulating the Russians you're going to get drunk in vodka uh, and, and uh, execute that. Uh, no, it means that you have to get into their mindset. You read upon it, well, how do they behave, what are their tools, do they taunt their targets, yes, no. And you can even write your own tools to emulate their, own, their tools if you're not able to get them. You execute, you generate your report, and then you go to the debrief. You go with Blue. We simulated this specific state actor that is threatening us. This is what we did. Did you saw us? Yes, no. If Blue saw you, cool. They're doing their job, and you go like, how long did it take you to see us? If they didn't saw you, you said, okay, guys, you didn't saw us. This is what we did. Let's improve on this. Let's repeat. and then we update our playbooks. If, if Blue caught us on those stuff and those techniques, we save those. And we make sure that in our SOPs when we're going, we're checking for that stuff. Many, many red teams that I know of have some of the sweetest rats and tool sets out there when they're going against a very good Blue team because they're constantly improving, constantly updating, constantly writing new shit to, buy, to, to, to be as stealthy as possible because Blue forces them to be good. And at the same time, Blue is getting better and better and better at detecting, containing, and remediating those attacks and investigating. Each other is feeding each other. You know, they're, they're working together. Um, it, it is like when you, you have your hammer, your anvil, and you're making that sort of, each, each one of them is improving the security of that sort. Both of them are kind of molding it, that, that security posture for that environment, that level of maturity for it. They're working together on it by each one of them kind of getting better. So uh, I, as I said, I had slides. So I, I, I kind of put one slide storyboard and get ahead of myself. Um, so typically the main considerations that we have to take when we're working on all of this stuff is what is the main goal that we want to achieve? Since the adversary should already be a known one, Blue should, should be able to detect that 
and trigger on it. If you're going, uh, if you're red and you're going through all of that stuff and it gets to a point that you're going like they haven't seen us, they haven't done anything, you have either two options. You can ratchet up a bit more the noise. Let's say a fake FBI notice and send it over to one of these stakeholders to have it be executed. Or you just start doing more noise in the network to see if they see you or not and catch you. And if, if even that doesn't work, just stop, just cut the exercise and then let's do a debrief to fix all of that stuff. And don't be cocky. Just, we bring it over, we work with Blue, and we improve the security of each other. Um, and we also kind of cover all those techniques and we share our tools with them so they know how to block those. Uh, so the last type of engagement that we typically tend to do is the uh, what we call a full scope attack simulation. Here's the one that everybody loves. This is the gloves are off. We're going in and we're trying to define what is going to be the scope of this. Are we going to be doing physical threat teaming? Are we going to try to break into the data center? Are we going to uh, clone cards? Or are we just going to be doing social engineering and doing phishing against the target? Or are we going to be going technical against the target? And you define all of those rules ahead of time. This is the goal. This is what we want to test. You define rules of engagement from the get-go, like, hey, Let's not uninstall patches on the box. Let's not do DOS. Make sure that we have some fake accounts from where we're still data. We don't want to kind of get real customer data out of, out of the site. Put it in, in a VPS somewhere and then have somebody hack our VPS and we just are kind of screwed. So we want to kind of set all of that stuff. And then we create our plan. This is how we're going to act. You guys are going to be our recon team. You guys are going to be our chirpas that are going to handle all of our chels. You, you are going to be in charge of persistence. And then we simply execute. We execute our engagement. We execute our engagement fast, hard, just like a real attacker. We take our time. It could be an engagement of two, three, four weeks. And then we, uh, we start interacting with Blue. We see if Blue is able to contain us, to pin us down, detect us, and then we do our debrief and then we inform them out about everything. And on that one, typically we have Blue go first, not, not red. Blue goes first. This is everything that we detected. This is everything that we did. Uh, this is how we reacted. Then red comes in and, and opens their kimono and says, this is how we got in. This is everything we did. You missed this, you didn't miss that. And what you're looking for is that that meantime, uh, between the uh, detection and reaction is shorter every time you do those. And for God's sake, guys, don't execute them three at the same time. So this is typically how we execute those. So the main considerations is there's no prior warning on this one. This is full engagement. There's no hand holding. This is us testing blue and blue being tested. The other part is our TTPs should be buried. If you have somebody that is your Metasploit expert and everything he knows how to do is Metasploit, probably not good for this. You want your pen tester that can be adaptive, that they can use whatever tool they need, write whatever tool they, they need uh, to write to get the job done. You vary your toolkit, you select the tools that you haven't used before, you look at what researchers are putting out there and you adapt those techniques so you can be as effective as possible. You want to test at the highest level how effective are the controls and the plans that are being executed. Specifically the plans. Are they able to contain us? Are they able to block us of moving? We're trying to help Blue improve those. Also, make sure that you have a list of emergency phones. I have had friends that have actually had the uh, FBI called in and an actual investigation called in, and it is because nobody decided to tell the stakeholder that, yes, we're doing a full engagement. So do that. Um, uh, I, I tell a lot of story about um, a test that uh, a friend, uh, that Bob, did on a customer. He was doing a test, he was doing a phishing scam. So how he, d he did this was he went in, they were able to find a printer, the printer had a SMTP server configured, they were able to use that printer's SMTP server to send an email internally to the entire organization. The email said, hey, 
uh, update on salary and bonuses for all C-level executives with a, a, a encrypted C, uh, zip file with a password, with a spreadsheet, with a macro that actually forced you to, uh, to click enable. He sent that, waited 10 seconds, and then sent another one. Please, everybody, message from HR, delete that email, was sent by accident. He got 90% click rate. <laughs> Automatically. You could train everybody not to do it, and they won't do it, and you get, you're getting 1%. His social engineer that did it, but he forgot to tell the stakeholder. And that didn't go well. But hey, we got 90% click, right? <laughs> so yeah, so kind of make sure that you tell the stakeholder what you're doing. Have that uh, kind of uh, open channel. So let's go over the uh, general recommendations. Without management buy-in, we're kind of screwed. And by us being at each other's throat when we're briefing in front of them, it's not useful. We're being dysfunctional. By us not playing properly with ops, we're not useful. We can play good with each other, but we also many times forget about ops. We forget about the help desk guys. We forget about the guys that manage the servers, the guys that do the constant deployment to the cloud and to the different environments. You know, Agile is great, we can move very fast, but also it's a lot of stress because stuff breaks a bit faster and that adds tension to ops. And us being, as a security organization, dicks to ops does not help. We have to learn to communicate and back our stuff with evidence. So do, do keep that in mind. As I mentioned, don't read, read te uh, team stuff to death. If you want to do a full engagement, do those at least once per quarter or twice a year. Most of the time, you, be, you should be doing threat emulation, table topping type of engagements. Um, uh, uh, and, and this one, I'm trying to think how I can kind of explain it. Many times what you're going to see is that you have an environment that that much, and Blue is always constantly asking, update this new GPO modify this setting and they're doing it every other day to ops it is like the kid that cried wolf it's going to get to a moment that security is going to be seen like the kid that cried wolf because we're going at a high tempo against ops asking ops to do changes in their environment we have to be more organized when we do that we did our engagement, we find out what's wrong, we create our nice report, this is how you're supposed to fix it, and then we give them one single set of things to do every other uh, two, three, four weeks, once a month, one every two, two months, it all depends. But let's not be just constantly crying wolf, going, this is in the news, fix this now, this, this sort of thing happened, oh, you should be careful with this. And we're always constantly emailing them on stuff that they need to change, emailing them, them stuff that they need to do, and then copying managers and going, oh, we're security, this is a high risk. That high tempo of blue going after ops is very uh, detrimental. I've actually seen it happen in many environments where they go like, uh, here comes the security guy again, yeah, yeah. Look at him walking with his minder with all of, it, all of the stuff that we're not doing perfectly. And, there's, and we're seen that way. We have to change that. And also, the ability for Red to be effective is the ability of Red of thinking outside the box. So we have to make sure that Red doesn't get institutionalized in the environment. Red, your job is to step on toes. Your job is to tell the ugly lie that the kid is ugly even if the parents doesn't like to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's just say a bit, he's not that smart. We've got into a situation where we tend to be a bit too PC. If Red is too PC, when it comes to delivering messages, we're going to, no, we're not going to say that. No, the manager's not going to like it you have a bad situation because that's the job of Red, of telling the manager what's wrong. And the manager should actually appreciate that. Also, we should be 
have a bit of tact when we say it. Yeah, 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 I can see he has that nice wart here. Uh, yeah, but he's cute. But yeah, he could be cuter. And you can, you know, you, there are ways of saying stuff, please. Um, and we have to break that tool-centric mentality. And that changes with training. And that changes with management. You should, uh, you should invest in your people. You should make sure that your people are trained and they're trained properly. Your people should know how to script. Your people should know how to code. Every time I see somebody tell me, uh, instant response guy or, or a red teamer, coding's not necessary, it's not mandatory. I go like, shit, it should be. They should be able to adapt. That gives them the flexibility, at least learn how to script. That gives them that flexibility because that is what is going to make them not be tool centric. If all of your pen tests are done with Cobalt Strike and Metasploit constantly, day in, day out, what value are you giving them? If you're not able to modify your behavior, if you're not able to modify how you're approaching the problem. Also control the egos, as I mentioned. Be, that, be the devil advocate, but don't be a saboteur. So typically when it comes to metrics, this is the part that everybody hates. Um, we cannot manage what we cannot measure, so we have to be very, uh, very concise on that. Now, the metrics should be set up from the get-go, where red winning doesn't mean that blue loses, or if blue wins, red loses. It cannot be that way, because all of a sudden, what do you do? You put them one against the other. Why do we hate sales, salespeople so much in many organizations? Because their metrics is how much stuff they sell. It's not if they sell the correct thing to the customer. Nobody measures that. It is, dude, you have a quota, you have $1 million by this trimester. They'll do whatever they need to do to get their quota because how, that is how they're measured. That is the metric that is being applied to them. Um, Measure the number of interactions and how they work together. How many times did red and blue sat down? What was um, the amount of uh, attack simulations that were detected? What was their time frame? And just look for improvement. And your metric is not if they missed those or if that number is higher. It is how did they improve? Did they detect that same type of attack on the next engagement? Yes, no. Think about those metrics. Think how you're measuring your blue and red team. Um, also, measure how they operate with the org. How do you pass that information? How many times did you guys decide, okay, we find a new attack technique is being used and being abused. Let's create a brief, let's do a webcast internally and share that. Uh, kind of push them to do that, to share that information internally to the other users. And, and try to put it in the metrics because that's going to be the fire under their asses to get them moving and sharing that information and being more proactive inside the org. Also, um, number of engagements should not be kind of like your metric. How many, uh, because then they'll just go through the numbers on them, measure the value of those engagements. You can actually measure how many tools have they written, modified, updated, and then shared with your team, you're measuring their, that they're forcing them to be good and at the same time share that information. I used to work for a, ver, a very good uh, consulting team that what they did is that part of our measure was how many knowledge-based articles did I wrote per quarter. I had to write one, every three months, one knowledge-based article on a subject, put it, in, uh, put it on, the, uh, on the chair and then uh, when, when you went to the, uh, to the chart point and you look at er everything in the comments, uh, people could actually gauge how good was our document or not or how useful and put comments in them. That was kind of like a very good metric for me. It made me improve tenfold because I had to learn how to research stuff, how am I going to communicate it, and then I could get that feedback and improve upon it. So we can add that as metric uh, on updating our uh, shared knowledge base and the quality of those contributions. Um, another thing is, on the blue side is very easy. How fast did you guys detect it? How fast did you guys fix it? Uh, how, what was the number of incidents that you handled and how well did you manage those? 
so, uh, and, and from our, everything in addition that we did for Red for updating that knowledge base and keeping stuff up to date, I think that the main two metrics for Blue are the last two ones. Time to detect, time to remediation. Those are kind of like the two main metrics that you should be looking at a Blue team. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm over my time, so guys, just keep calm um, and think purple. Well, we're, we're all the purple team, and big thanks to these guys that did all of the review of my slides and provided <laughs> feedback.